Hi, everyone. Welcome to and thank you for joining us today for this closing event of the Radical Exchange Fellowship Program. My name is Jennifer Marone, and I'm CEO of the Radical Exchange Foundation. For those that are less familiar or still questioning what Radical Exchange is, it's a social movement made up of a global community concerned about economic inequality, divided societies, and decaying democratic institutions. To combat these trends, we need next generation political economies that advance plurality, equality, community, and that break down the centralization of power and concentration of wealth. And to do this, Radical Exchange looks to mechanism design and creating new kinds of institutions that are more prepared to deal with the technologies of the 21st and future centuries and help meet the needs of society. Many of the concepts Radical Exchange is working with and first coalesced around in 2018 sprung from Glenn Weil and Eric Posner's book, Radical Markets, concepts such as quadratic voting, common ownership self-assessed tax or cost, and data intermediaries, among other ideas, continue in a malleable form to be experimented with, adapted, advanced, and expanded on by the community. In 2018, Glenn Weil also founded the Radical Exchange Foundation, which is dedicated to advancing the RxC movement by building community and educating about democratic innovation. One of the examples of this commitment to advancing the social movement is the fellowship program. We created the program because we noticed a significant gap in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And this gap is particularly perilous for the entrepreneurs and change makers that want to develop public goods and common property resources. For example, if we look at the ecosystem as a spectrum from funding to bringing to the market, on one side, we will see fund government funding for research and development of public goods. But on the other end, while there are accelerated programs and funding sources, they're usually only interested in bringing private and club goods to market. And so the Radical Exchange Fellowship Program was designed to fill that gap, to help change makers focused on value creation, not value capture, get the guidance they need to be able to make an impact without adopting the growth at all cost VC backed business model. Our aim was to provide fellows with a platform and connect them with others to help them consider their projects in a way so that they can deliver meaningful economic and societal change. The fellows explored radical ideas and asked big questions around 12 RxC development goals which were pegged to four themes, governance, property, data, and competition. And so over the past 10 weeks, this diverse cohort of 16 mission-driven individuals have been working on 12 projects to strengthen civil society and contribute to the creation of new public goods. It's been an immensely rewarding experience to get to know each of them and to help support their projects at this very critical stage. Before we get to hear from the fellows, we're first going to have a few words from our sponsors, followed by Matt Pruitt, Radical Exchange President. And please stay tuned for later on a conversation with Glenn Weil and Vitalik Buterin after the fellows' presentations. So I'm, now I'm going to pass it on to Trent McConaughey, founder of Ocean Protocol, a blockchain-based ecosystem that helps unlock the value of data. Trent. All right. Hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here today and always a pleasure to be part of different radical exchange events. So um, I'll just uh, I have a few quick words. Um, I'll start out. If civilization had an objective function, we'd be we would do well by um, by thinking about Maslow's hierarchy. Um, let's recall what the hierarchy is. The base of it is about barely getting by, you know, food, clothing, shelter, water, one level up healthcare and education. And by the time we get to the top, it's about self-actualization, chasing your dreams, whatever that may be. So going back to the objective function, you know, a good objective function might be, you know, getting 100% of people, um, optimizing towards 100% of people, 100% of people having the opportunity to self-actualize. And it's a gradual thing, of course, right? Pull up more and more people um, from the lowest levels, barely getting by, um, to adequate healthcare, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's kind of, you know, a way that I think about um, work that I do and work for Ocean and otherwise, and I think it plays well with Radical Exchange. So let's pull this directly into, um, as an idea, um, on this objective, how, how do, you know, can public goods and civic tech play a role? Uh, and the answer is yes, because you can use um, public goods and civic tech to help level the playing field towards equalizing the opportunities, uh, opportunities to, to get an education, opportunities to get healthcare, and ultimately opportunities to self-actualize. Um, as an example, right, it's hard to get ahead if you have to work three minimum wage jobs just to feed your family, right? 
Or for another thing, it's counterproductive to get an education that puts you into debt for two decades that follow, right? And public goods help to alleviate this, right? I, um, I come from Canada, rural Canada, where it was actually the world's first um, universal health care. And um, that was back in the 60s. And since then, it's spread throughout the world. And, you know, Saskatchewan, my province benefited a lot from it. And, you know, I live in Germany now, it has that. And, you know, it, it saddens me whenever I see nations that are otherwise developed still have health care and holding people back, right? For example, it's the greatest cause of bankruptcy in the USA, which is too bad, right? Because it's holding people back from self-actualizing. So back to the public goods, permissionless public networks can be viewed as a public good. They're public utilities, they're accessible to all, um, they give a level playing field for all, right? So, um, so these can be treated as a tool to help us um, towards this goal, this objective function of self-actualization. Um, and you know, to recap overall, you know, to self-actualize, we need a level playing field. For a level playing field, um, we have tools such as these networks, but um, critically, we really need a foundation of sovereignty at the level of individuals, but not only at the level of individuals, but larger and larger groups, sovereignty for families, for NGOs, for SMEs, cities, enterprises, and even nations, sovereignty at every level. Um, we live in this digital era, right? In this digital era, we emanate data. We use data, we rely on data. It's an era of data and it's super valuable, right? This is the fortunes that Google and Facebook uh, that have made because they've discovered that by hoarding data, data that isn't really theirs, they can make these fortunes. Yet, despite the value of the data that everyone talks about, individuals and smaller organizations don't get any real benefit from all that data, right? Um, so how do we go about addressing this, right? Uh, to address it, people need to be able to control you know, their data. Um, what is seen by whom, where, and when, right? People need a way to share openly their data, to track the provenance. And you know, critically, if data is so valuable and we wanna help the people, then the people need an opportunity to monetize that data, right? There's a yin and a yang between sharing and monetization. And so going to Ocean, right? Ocean kind of fits in this overall context from the top level of self-actualization towards uh, public utilities, um, civic goods, public utility networks. And so Ocean is designed, um, and then at the level of data, so Ocean is designed to help people and organizations in this way, to reclaim their data sovereignty. At its core, there's access control mediated by a public utility network. There's a means to share data, to track the provenance of sharing, and critically, a means to monetize, to really reduce the friction to monetizing, solving issues of privacy, solving issues of pricing, and so on. Um, and it's really, once again, you know, it's, it's my pleasure and it's the pleasure of Ocean to be able to play a role in radical exchange, um, you know, to help people think about data to, um, and what other lever, levers can be used um, and tools um, towards these higher and higher level goals all the way to the top of Maslow's hierarchy. So with that, I'll wrap up, say thank you very much um, for the opportunity to be here. And just mention, if you want to learn more, uh, simply go to oceanprotocol.com and uh, at Ocean Protocol on Twitter, or simply my Twitter handle is at TrentumC0. M as in McConaughey. So that's all. And once again, thanks for having me and uh, good luck in, in, in the event today. I think it's gonna be, a, yeah, a great event. Thank you, Trent. And now we're gonna hear from Shiv Malik of Streamer, our other sponsor. Shiv, I'll pass it off to you. Hi, so um, Lawrence said to just keep it short, two minutes. So I'm just gonna give two pieces uh, of advice. But first thing I wanna say is it's been a real pleasure to work with or mentor and also sponsor a bunch of people who are really, really smart and enthusiastic and energetic. Uh, it's just, it's, it's very humbling to be able to be a part of that in any way that you can be. Um, so first, first thing I'd say is, I think a major source of very predictable irrationality is bad time preference, right? Uh, people think too short term. And so my advice would be force yourself to think long term. Uh, it, and it's, it's like a dedicated effort. Uh, you'll all know about the marshmallow test. So maybe we all missed out because we needed to have done that age three. Uh, and it's already too late. But force yourself to think long term and therefore design organizations and organizational structures with low discount rates, right? Which sounds a little dry, but, you know, lock in those benefits and incentives when right from the beginning, right from the beginning, like Ulysses, tie yourself to the mast to stop yourself from being tempted later on. 
uh, because those temptations will come if you're successful. Uh, maybe even more pithily, uh, buyouts are for sellouts, uh, foundations, cooperatives, mutuals, DAOs, all these new organizational structures, actually, and some of them are very old, in fact, they distribute those benefits at the global level. And that's really what you should be working for. Uh, the second piece of advice is actually not mine at all. It's from Brewster Kale. Uh, and it's something I've been trying to integrally imbibe uh, into my own being. And it's very difficult because it goes against rather like time preference, human nature, which is give it away. Give it away. Right? If you're designing and building, especially in open source, and you're trying to build a network, give you know, whatever you have, give it away, because it will come back in spades later on. You can, it's easy to have 100% of nothing, but it's much better to have 5% of something much, much larger than yourself. That's it. Uh, if you want to catch me, I'm addi addicted to Twitter, just at Shiv Malik. So I'm pretty much always there. <laughs> Thanks, Shiv. And now we're going to have a few words from Matt, the Radical Exchange President. I just want to say a few words uh, to thank uh, everyone who helped make this program happen. Uh, first, thank you to our sponsors, um, Ocean Protocol and Streamer. And um, everything that we do at Radical Exchange uh, depends upon a big network of people uh, dedicating their time to, to help make um, special things happen. So I first would like to thank the Radical Exchange team, uh, Lawrence Lundy Bryan, Leon Erickson, Angela Corpus, Fanny Lacobe, Jen Marone, Alex Rondaccio, and Tim Meggert for all of the time that you have put into uh, helping to make this program a success. Uh, and I also want to thank the many uh, mentors and speakers who contributed uh, to, to this program. So I'll, I'll read their names quickly, but there are, um, uh, each of them deserves a longer individual thank you. Uh, Joel Rogers, Kevin Awaki, Santi Siri, Michael Bowens, Nathan Schneider, Camille Canon, Joe Goldie, Amber Lamke, Audrey Tong, Suji Yan, Maimona Tumar, Peter Pan, Beatrice Helena Ramos, Matt Clifford, Vitalik Buterin, Glenn Weil, Christopher Calendron Thomas, Reese Lynn Mark, Simon De La Rouvier, Shiv Malik, Joanne Chung, Pooja Olhaver, Joe Lamke, Tom Lyons, Maria Penanen, and others who I'm sure that I'm forgetting. Um, very, very grateful for your time, uh, as are, I'm sure, all the fellows. Thank you for everything you're doing. And um, with that, let's, uh, let's turn to the fellows. Up first, um, over to you, Govan. Hey, thank you. I am Aaron. Soskin from Govern. Um, let me go ahead and start sharing my screen. Awesome. Uh, so thanks for having us here today. Like I said, my name is Aaron Soskin, uh, and I'm here with Christine Vandevoort, and we are from Govern, um, where we are building the future of politics and democracy. So a couple of years ago, when we started having the idea for this project, we wanted to get to a simple idea or a simple problem. Um, why don't we? Why are we unhappy when it comes to politics today? And it turns out, as we we started to ask people, we heard a common uh, phrase: one, it feels like no one listens to my voice, or two, that there's no effective way for me to tell my politician, even if I did have something to say. We just don't feel heard. And when we dug into this, what we realized the real cause of this pain was actually the problem of broken trust. And this is a really important thing we wanna call out. Since 1960, since Pew Research has been tracking, trust in government is at an all time low of 17%. And what I wanna note here, this is not a political issue. Trust in government has gone down with every political administration regardless of political, regardless of political affiliation. And the reason why this is a big deal is because when we stop trusting our politicians, we disengage. And when we disengage, we become susceptible to big centralized interests that create events like this and create more events like this, a shooting that happened just a couple of weeks ago or shootings that happened many years ago. We see similar levels of distress happening in places like Myanmar and Hong Kong. When we lose the right to self-determination, and when we start to see our ent uh, entire side of the country 
uh, become victim to global warming and climate change. All of these problems led us to ask the question, who has power in politics? If we felt like we didn't have the power to make change, who did? And it turns out there's five groups that do have power in politics today. Lobbyists, big money donors, PACs, special interest groups, and political parties. And they have power in politics today because they understand two things. These two things. The cost of elections has been going up at an incredible pace. And in 2020, in the Senate, it cost $27 million to win and $23 million just to lose in the Senate. And that 80% of the time, the candidate that spends more money ends up winning the election. And these big, these PAC, these lobbyists, they have essentially turned into centralized piggy banks or coordination machine with little oversight. Okay, let's dig in a little bit further. What's the difference between us and big money? Why do they have the upper hand here? And when we look into our toolbox, this is what we found. Big money has wrenches, they got hammers, they have clamps, picks, ax, and sometimes it feels like they're even magical. They have all of these different tools and we, the people, we have voting, which is good, but it kind of feels like duct tape compared to all of these people. Um, it, it's dependable, but it breaks pretty easily. And a lot of people in the space, a lot of other solutions, what they aim to do is they try to fix the problem like this. They wanna take away the tools of big money, which is definitely one solution. But the issue with this solution is that it doesn't actually fix the core underlying incentive. Campaign finance became a tool for big money because the incentive existed. Taking away the tools doesn't take away the incentive. At Govern, we have a different approach. Instead of trying to equalize the playing field by bringing everyone down to the same level, we want to give everyone access to the same tool. If you think of Ethereum or DeFi as allowing anyone to be their own bank, Govern in decentralized politics enables anyone to be their own political party, anyone to be their own PAC, anyone to be their own politician. This isn't just decentralized government, this is decentralized politics. And so the first tool we're starting with is this tool called outcome-based donations. Outcome-based donations are donations held in escrow contracts until predefined community metrics are reached. For example, I really care about fixing education in San Francisco, so I could donate $100 to the mayor of San Francisco only if high school graduation rates go up by 2% in the next four years. And only if that outcome is achieved, only if that metric is achieved, does she receive my donation towards her next political campaign. See, what we're doing here is we're leveraging that campaign finance incentive and realigning it so that it doesn't just work for centralized big money. It works for the constituents, it works for the people. And that key innovation of outcomes provides the scalable trust because no longer do you have to trust the politician, you trust the system. All of this contributes to our bigger vision of creating a world for open source politics and governance. One that is open or free, as in anyone can participate. You don't have to be a pol politician. You don't have to belong to a political party. It is transparent. It is composable by nature and it is opt in, giving users exit rights in their democracy today. Um, on the govern layer, we can work at a much in more innovative pace, testing ideas like quadratic voting or liquid democracy, and then using mechanisms like outcome-based donations to take the best ideas um, and best organizations that happen up here and push them down to our base layer of government, which intentionally moves slow. It moves slow to protect us. So the govern layer is where we can actually start to innovate and use the ideas of openness, transparency, composability, and opt-in governance. So far, what we've, what we've been working on this for a while, and during our time of Radical Exchange here, we've gotten our open source white paper out and live. Um, we want people to come on and get feedback. Further, we want you to come join the movement. There's five ways you can help out. One, engage with the white paper. Two, contribute to the Govern DAO open source repo, which is the uh, vehicle for outcome-based donations. Sign up to build a city coalition, write about Govern, and follow us on Twitter. Um, feel free to reach out to us at Aaron at govern.io or Christina at, at govern.io, and thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much, Aaron and Govern. Um, wonderful. So off to um, Hamilton now. Thank you, Lawrence, and it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking to all of you today. Uh, my name is Sydney Lee, and I'm working with my partner, Alvin Tam, on our project called Hamilton. Companies today are facing some of the largest challenges of scale, whether they're a growth stage startup looking to double or triple their headcount, or a large corporation that faces deep silos. 
traditional wisdom has been that in any organization, division of labor allows you to operate efficiently, which is why organizations become siloed. This comes at the cost of preventing really productive discussions that help companies take advantage of the growing diversity within their workforce. Specifically, many corporations are unable to unlock the diversity of ideas within their silos. But I think what a lot of people miss, right, is that the idea of community and the idea of a efficient organization actually have a lot in common. Both are able to respect the capabilities and unique value of their fellow members. Both are able to operate based off of a shared purpose and a shared set of values. And both are built around common as well as complementary aspirations with, with aligned incentives. The existing solutions in the space tend to be very manual, right? Like team retreats, company sports teams, ad hoc coffee chats, which means there isn't a scalable model for creating sustainable connections within a large organization. Our solution is based off the observation that shared identities actually do bring people together. They help create strong communities as well as efficient organizations. And we want to present a solution that connects people organically and paves the way for genuine relationships. Unmuted, great. Uh, so our solution is to create a structured space to spark long lasting connections. Hamilton is a non-monetary marketplace that connects people organically through favors. Individuals can come to our platform, post favors that they need help with, and find ways to help other people in their organization. And these favors can relate to workplace matters, uh, such as asking for help to learn JavaScript. And they can also involve tasks outside of work, uh, like dog sitting, helping with a move, uh, or even getting grandma onto Facebook. Favors is essentially how people get introduced to one another. But as people complete these favors for one another, they can actually build rapport. So for example, let's say that someone needs help uh, moving decorations to the new office, uh, and they enlist the help of someone new uh, that they haven't met before on Hamilton. Uh, during their conversation while they're moving, they realize that uh, they both came from the same hometown in Michigan, uh, but at the same time, they really care about sustainability and how it's affected um, their, their, current, their current workplace. And although this starts with just one conversation, uh, that favor left a positive first impression in the other person's mind. And that plants a seed for cultivating a longer term sustainable connection. And um, perhaps later on, these two people will meet again uh, to advocate for better sustainability uh, practices in their company's cafeteria. So this is just one conversation and not every interaction will lead to uh, these you know, long lasting uh, connections. But it's the fact that Hamilton can be used uh, naturally, organically um, and sustained over time uh, that there are so many interactions that hopefully uh, will actually over time bring the organization closer together and create some sort of community. Uh, people are incentivized to use Hamilton on an individual level because who doesn't like having an extra helping hand every now and then. Uh, but also they'll have a score uh, on Hamilton that tracks their contribution to their community. Um, and this is the value that they add to the people around them in the workplace uh, that sits you know, outside of work uh, that doesn't necessarily factor into your performance. And this score increases when they help someone who they haven't met before. To make Hamilton more scalable and effective, we need to accomplish two things with technology. First, we match people who ought to know each other uh, using community detection algorithms and link analysis on the organization graph. And we also uh, need to create a normalized score that incentivizes people to contribute and give back. And this is done using statistical normalization um, and is also enhanced by natural language processing techniques. Uh, Next slide. Yes. So over the fellowship, uh, we have made quite a lot of progress in developing this concept further. Uh, we've really kind of outlined what narrative we want to tell with Hamilton and what the value proposition is. Uh, we started iterating on our product flow and wireframe uh, so that after the fellowship, now we can hit the ground running and actually build. Uh, and also, most importantly, we really identified who we want to prioritize uh, as a potential Hamilton partner. Uh, we settled on corporations uh, because they have the sweet spot, uh, uh, or more or less, uh, Hamil uh, corporations can be greatly helped by this, uh, and they suffer from these organizational challenges. But there's also the sweet spot of people being um, vaguely acquaintances with each other uh, in the fact that they can perhaps uh, have something in common, uh, which is that they work for this common company or mission. They care about this common mission. Uh, but once we prove it out in corporations, our long, long-term future uh, plan 
uh, would essentially be to release the consumer version of Hamilton so that we can connect people who live together in the same town. Uh, we can connect people across district lines. And that is essentially uh, what we care about in the future. Uh, but for now, uh, we want to uh, develop this idea further with potential corporation partners. Uh, so if you guys know anybody who may be interested in using Hamilton, uh, please let us know. Uh, we're particularly looking for siloed companies, large companies that might have at least 500 employees. And we're also interested in talking to growth stage startups uh, who are concerned about keeping their startup culture uh, consistent as they scale to hundreds of employees. Uh, next slide. So essentially at Hamilton, our mission is to help humanity flourish through the power of connection. And if you care about this as deeply as we do, uh, then please do not hesitate to reach out. Our emails are in the bottom right corner. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sydney and Alison. Wonderful. Um, so now over to Deborah and uh, Paola to hear more about the Taiwanese civic tech ecosystem. Sorry, I was on mute. Okay. Um, okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Lawrence. Okay. So, hi, everyone. I'm Deborah Tian, and today we'll be sharing some of the findings from the research Paula Berman and I have been conducting um, all around how not all civ tech is made equal. Um, what can we learn from the Taiwanese civ tech ecosystem? So Paul and I have been researching this topic together throughout the fellowship, and we've recently actually started co-authoring a piece with uh, Radical Exchange President Matt Pruitt, who inspired a core hypothesis of our work. So one of the challenges we've seen within civic tech in general, globally, is that many people have lost hope in the internet's promise of helping us transition to a digital democracy. We've seen on one end that civic tech has actually not really solve the problems of polarization. Um, and on the other end, we see that civic tech sometimes is used more as a tokenizing uh, technique to govern for people as opposed to governing with or governing by. Um, we think these two challenges actually aggravate each other in a negative feedback loop. However, what we've discovered is that there is one civic tech ecosystem that stands out as a shiny exception to this rule. Um, just to give an example around Taiwan, um, Taiwan has a platform called the Taiwan and also Join, which uses um, uses technology, uses machine learning um, to help citizens deliberate and listen to each other at scale. Four years into this experiment, almost half the country has participated. So that's almost that's about 10.5 million people. Uh, active visitors for a population of 24 million. So, I mean, just imagine getting half of your city to just go to a town meeting or half, even just half of your neighborhood to join a neighborhood meeting, let alone um, participate actively. It's, it's quite impressive. And the other impressive thing is through this platform, um, there's been several legislative decisions that have been made by the citizens and 80% have actually gone to ahead to decisive government action. I think that's pretty cool. And so that's why, and Paula does too, so that's why we decided, hey, let's, let's look at this ecosystem a little more carefully. Um, we're super glad to be part of this fellowship um, because actually we had a great uh, exposure experience with Audrey Tang, who's the Digital Minister of Taiwan. Um, we had a lot of relevant readings around, um, including this, this talk by Min Chun Lee, and a lot of um, the mentors and fellows who have generously shared a lot of resources, insights, and feedback. So just wanted to give a quick shout out to that. Thank you, everyone. So anyway, what does our paper actually look at? Because um, of course we could look at the civ tech ecosystem in so many different ways. We decided to focus actually on comparing the U.S. and Taiwan. We we chose the U.S. because we want because the U.S. has such a prominent role as a global leader in technology, and as we started doing more research into this comparison, we surfaced several uh, similarities and differences. A lot of people think uh, Taiwan and the US are, are quite different, they are, but both are actually uh, diverse democracies with fairly high standards of living, skilled workforces, developed technology industries, and um, large investments in, invest in, in defense. So we wanted to look at you know, what does this mean? But one of the big differences here 
um, can come out when services when we start comparing how the U.S. and Taiwan institutionalize civ tech. So in the U.S., we look at Code for America, um, and in Taiwan, we looked at the Gov Zero um, kind of movement of nobodies coming in the ecosystem. And through those two initiatives, we also have um, United States Digital Service and 18F on the US side and the Digital Ministry on the, on the Taiwan side. And when we were starting to look a little more carefully at these different institutions within CivTech, we realized, um, well, we came up with a hypothesis around how the US and Taiwan actually are so different because they have entirely different conceptions of where the authority of the state comes from. So we have a hypothesis here that the U.S. Um, views the um, the state as a service provider, whereas the U.S. or sorry, whereas the Taiwan views the state as a social social fabric strengthener. And this this tweet from from Audrey Tang we thought summarized this quite well, where governments around the world can start with one simple principle, trust the citizens more. And it's it's quite symbolic because it was the first tweet from um, Audrey Tang to US President Biden and Vice President Harris soon after their, their win. So we think that actually understanding more about the social history social historical background of these conceptions would help us better understand how these conceptions arose and how they could potentially even change. So we have a hypothesis looking specifically at philosophical influences, pathways to democracy, internal social political rifts and repairs, and geopolitical uh, relationships, and how do they fit in with Taiwan and, and US. Um, and part of our paper will also include looking, developing a set of recommendations for governance of SIPTEC ecosystems. This is of course in progress, but so far we've, we've we summarized it with um, the wonderful words of Audrey Tang, um, thinking about how can we make the system fast, fair, and fun. Finally, what's next? Um, right now, we would love any feedback uh, on our framing. We're just in the process of writing a piece right now, as mentioned before. Um, we would love introductions to interviews with uh, USA and Taiwan CivTech ecosystem players and um, any suggestions for relevant publications. You can find us on Twitter and email. And that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deborah. Over to um, Douglas Powell to tell us a little bit more about opportunity.coop. Doug, I think you, you have to press the present button right next to the share button in the upper right corner of the screen. The yes. And you're on mute. Okay. Hopefully now everyone can hear me. Yes. Uh, my project is called uh, opportunity.coop, and it is a collective action platform for common good ventures. By common good ventures, uh, we're referring to ventures that provide public good um, and also ventures that are founded by social entrepreneurs. The problem that we're trying to solve is that VC funding and development opportunities are, are very low for diverse entrepreneurs and for social good projects. Uh, most of the time, um, VCs very, very seldom um, find that their funds go to a diverse group of people. Um, a high 90 some percent goes to a very specific demographic group or, or group of entrepreneurs. It's important to solve because common good ventures provide massive public return on investment, but
but they don't provide the private return on investment needed by traditional venture capitalists. Everyone can see that public goods and common goods and social entrepreneur, entrepreneurial ventures really benefit so many people. And they benefit these people in, in very direct and measurable financial and, and non-financial ways. But what we find is that organizations who run these programs and start these ventures find it difficult to measure the, um, the benefits, the return on their investment, particularly in monetary terms. And this is because it's the benefits and the returns go to a very diverse group of publics rather than a very specific um, small group of early investors. And they have adopted an attitude that is somewhat based on the, if you can't measure it, it doesn't exist. They seem to be, um, we seem to be operating under a, if we don't measure it, it doesn't exist, which is really um, causing major problems in society today. So our solution that we're proposing is a collection action platform for funding and scaling common good ventures. And until this year, some, uh, you know, many may have doubted that collective action could make serious economic um, impact in, in, in typical business areas as we, as we find most common good ventures. But with the Reddit rebellion and um, the, the, the massive um, action and impact of small groups of people working in unison, I think that after this year, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious to everyone that large, massive financial institutions can be very easily and heavily impacted by collective action. So we're looking very much forward to setting up a platform that allows people to quickly go in and support the common good projects and ventures that they would benefit from. The progress that we've made during the Radical Exchange Fellowship Program has really been, uh, uh, it's been amazing to me. I had been working on this for some time. And during this program, uh, we have finalized the platform functions so that we now have specifications for providing membership, um, a membership system to, to entrepreneurs that honors the members' data dignity, three democratic governance options, a decentralized ownership model where ownership is never centralized from day one, from the first day that you launch your venture on this platform, the community members and yourself all get a share uh, in, the, in the net profits of whatever venture you're launching. And we also um, have worked very closely with a number of the mentors and, and fellows on um, building out a crypto economic system that allows crowdfunding to take in pre-order funds or funds for a venture and return those funds and share those funds with all of the members of the, um, of the cooperative. We drafted our charter to um, incorporate in the state of Cal uh, Colorado. And that was um, very, very much assisted by a number of the um, mentors and connections that were made through mentors to, to find the proper state for a cooperative as um, wide ranging um, in its functions as this. And the most pleasant surprise was by the end of the 10th period, um, we've been able to invite and have accepted um, a, very, a very radical board of directors that, um, that 
with no compromise on competency, skills, knowledge, experience, uh, we were able to actually meet one of our objectives, which was to have board of directors composed of 80% of underrepresented people in the typical VC pipeline. So what's next is we need to build the software platform or complete building parts of the software. And we want to build this software and every application that we have on the platform in a way that prioritizes humans over profit. And we want to build a crypto economic system that passes the benefits of network effects to the actual network of people who are generating those benefits. The, the greatest thing that you can do, um, if, this, if this interests you and seems um, worthwhile, is to connect with us and become a member. We, we have a beta site up right now at the address that you see on the screen, beta-opportunity-coop.org. That is a temporary site while we have our cooperative officially recognized by the co-op domain registrar, but um, we really need um, any developers that are interested in working on helping us complete the platform. The code doesn't need to be written from scratch. Interestingly enough, most of the code to do this exists out there right now in open source projects. It just hasn't been integrated um, into a package that social entrepreneurs who are not developers can easily use. And we also are looking for any, um, anyone who's trying to get their common good venture off the ground and finding great difficulties in getting VC funding. So thank you for your time and we hope to see you soon. Thank you very much, Doug. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. If you could, uh... If you could unshare your screen, we will uh, go over to find uh, Elena and um, discussing uh, her project, Art House. Elena, over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Elena Molina. I am a Cuban artist, a cyber and a cultural entrepreneur. I live between Barcelona and Havana, where I founded the artist residency, Art House. I applied to the Radical for Change Fellowship, looking for help on building civic technologies and to think about social problems in Cuba. I believe there is a need for it because we are undergoing a rapid change in our economy and in the relations between citizens and government. There are many challenges. The biggest one, I would say, are wide stagnation, Cuban's financial destitution, digital device, and our government's reply to these issues has been moving towards more centralization. Citizens are already looking for ways to cope with these issues. Civic networks are popping up, activism and policy making is happening. Everything is going very fast. There's also a sharp increase in Google search for cryptocurrency, blockchain and NFTs. So that is a trend. There are good things happening like galleries and artists collaborating together uh, to share information about NFTs and creating community funds so Cuban artists are able to produce art and sell it online. But because- Sorry to all... interrupt, Elena, but you're not sharing your screen. Would you mind just sharing your screen? Am I not? If it doesn't work, it's okay to just talk um, talk to the slides. Is it Wonderful. working now? Yep. If you could just um, go into presentation mode. All right. It's okay to go from the slide that you're on, slide three. 
Should I start over or just go to... Slide three was fine, I was following. Um, okay, so as I was saying, there are good things happening, like galleries and artists collaborating, but because everything is so near, there are also bad things happening. We're seeing other stuff like growing crypto community, like pyramidal schemes, market monopolization, and startups developing infrastructure with scalable and reverse models. So what could be the solution? What could help Cubans grow better? I believe civic tech could help citizens to work collectively toward a more equitable economy. The biggest insight I have got as a cultural manager is that the creation of projects I support and collaborate with is a social responsibility. I take it very seriously and that's why I want to bring to Cuba socially conscious initiatives and applications that embrace egalitarianism and innovations for the greater good. For that, we're organizing Public Goods for Cuba, a series of talks, workshops, and hackathons that will serve as a meeting point for local and international communities exploring next generation economies, radical models for reducing inequality, how to build church prosperity, and how to heal political divides. Our programs will be an, inv an invitation to Cuban civil society to rethink current ownership structures and public goods, in relation to cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and to discuss decentralized technologies and data governance. Through our co-creation events, we aim to foster collective intelligence and a global interdisciplinary collaboration and research, supporting communities in building infrastructure and creating open technologies to create generating public goods. So citizens have the opportunity to decide if these technologies and models can help them build a better future. We hope to shift this to community building, education, and action between civil leaders, organizations, scholars, and innovators. Radical for Change Global Network is a good place to find such initiatives, as radical movement values and ideas address many of the problems that we're dealing with in Cuba today. We do have the language issue, so we're all inviting uh, Spanish-speaking uh, projects from Spain, Argentina, Sweden that are working on blockchain and the Ethereum ecosystem. We're uh, running polls to identify main issues uh, with the civic networks and activists in Cuba. And because crypto art and NFTs are now a local trend, this is a perfect timing for developing broadcasting channels to share information and to build community. In general, we are gathering support to organize this event, looking for sponsors, collaborators, or for anyone that wants to reach out because maybe they have an experience or a project that could help Cubans to take action for their future. You can find me on Instagram of the Art House Residency or through my email that you can see on the screen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena. So up next to, uh, to carry on the Latin American um, focus is Emilio, who will um, discuss his project um, based out of Panama. Emilio. Hi, uh, Lauren, could you allow me to connect my video? There you are. Yeah, okay. So let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? We can, thank you. If you could um, just uh, go full screen if possible. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for the opportunity. Firstly, I would like to thank the whole Radical Exchange team for this 10-week immersion into 
uh, civic uh, technologies um, all the work that, that you guys are, are doing I'm, I'm really appreciative of of everything that i've learned in this uh, past uh, 10 weeks i also would like to uh, especially thank uh, matt lawrence uh, jennifer uh, glenn um uh, professor yo for for their time uh, spending in supporting me when i when i started the, the program i i thought that i had a a, a clear uh, a frame uh, through which I uh, address uh, the problem that I wanted to address that is uh, enhanced my, my city's uh, capacity to, to foster uh, civility. However, uh, throughout the 10 week uh, process, uh, I, I went through a, a, a very uh, transformational <laughs> experience. Uh, first, uh, learning that probably uh, mobility that was the, the initial uh, topic of my of my work it wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna make a, a big difference uh, if I didn't uh, take into account other variables in the in the equation. So after a very lengthy deliberation uh, uh, within the community and also uh, here in Panama, uh, friends and, and colleagues, uh, I shifted the the approach of the of the a project and now I, I went from the mobility uh, uh, problem in the city to the, pro, the project that I, I now call uh, Area Metropolitana Amigable. Uh, locally, I can also say Amicable Metropolitan Area in English, so, so it can be easily interchangeable. So basically, uh, the project is, is, start, is uh, trying to, to address a, a number of, of problems. Uh, some of them have, have already been uh, presented by, by my fellow. Um, one of them, probably one of the more difficult ones uh, and ingrained in our society is the bias uh, urban uh, planning uh, that is mostly uh, top-down, uh, uninformed, uh, resource allocation as a result of the top-down top process uh, that results in socioeconomic inequity. And something that, that I'm starting to see and uh, that worries me a lot is the insecurity, uh, particularly in, in nightlife in the, in the, in the city. Um, even though we have a, we have a well-connected uh, financial uh, sector and also the Panama Canal, uh, our global presence is still uh, timid, so we need to work uh, on that. And probably uh, the most difficult uh, factor to, to depict is the decaying uh, civility, uh, a, a word that, uh, that I learned from, from Professor uh, Yo. So why, why the AMA project? Uh, because I have skin, skin in the game. Uh, I, if things don't change, I, I plan to spend the rest of my statistical life in, in, in Panama City. So I have to be part of the solution and not uh, part of the problem or just part of the, of the crowd that just benefiting, benefiting from whatever is in the, in the city for us. So uh, taking some of the literature in, in, the, in the program, uh, I laid out this uh, proposal of these four areas where we, we humans uh, engage, and now we have to find through participative a process a way in which we enhance those, uh, those four areas. So I have been developing the, the website. It's going to be uh, Amadat City. Uh, the initial program was uh, to work in, in 26 townships. But then I realized through geographic information system that there are so many interconnections. So I had to broaden the, the scope of the, of the program, basically following the, 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 the toddler's uh, law that, that says that, that uh, things that are closer together are more related than things that are, far, uh, that are apart. So I went from 26 to our 116 townships in the, in the metropolitan area basically including uh, the two main provinces in the, in the, in the country, province of Panama and province of, of Panama Oeste, West Panama. So the, the project will be, will be executed in, for that area. So in terms of the solution, uh, through GIS, Geographic Information System, quadratic voting, quadratic funding, and um, a police, 
I will work with uh, citizens uh, to build a plausible development scenario for their, their streets, their community, their township, and municipalities. So it's, it's going to be a very organic uh, process uh, to develop and deploy AMA uh, through civic participation uh, in, in, our, in our region. So what's next? Uh, I'm planning on an online launch on April the 15th uh, at 8 p.m. And I uh, expect that throughout this, uh, the very remaining of the project that is about uh, four months, I will be able to uh, mobilize uh, between 10 and 15,000 uh, citizens uh, to help me in, in putting together a framework to turn uh, the metropolitan area of Panama into a more uh, a civil um, uh, and a more harmonious uh, place, a place to live. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amelia. Wonderful. So going from a uh, very local um, solution to a very global solution, uh, over to Jack and Saeed, um, who are going to introduce the Global Center for Risk and Innovation. Yeah, hello, everyone. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, I'm Jack. I'm co-founding the Global Center for Risk and Innovation. It's a member-run organization established on the premise that um, non-state actors need better digital public infrastructure. Uh, first, though, I'd like to say how uh, wonderful and, and valuable this fellowship has been, both for my own intellectual growth and, and for our plans at the GCRI. It's been a great opportunity for us to bring all the values and ideas of radical exchange into concrete implementation. Uh, I'm so grateful to be a part of this work and, and a part of this conversation. Uh, COVID ha has powerfully reminded us of how deeply we're all interconnected, and this is a moment for transformation. Uh, we've seen much of the West take a technology first approach to COVID, uh, now in vaccine rollout, but at terrible untold costs over the last year. There was another way, far more successful, the socio-technical approach taken by Taiwan and others uh, with clear benefits and lessons for us all as we face more global risks on the horizon, whether climate change or pandemics, um, but no lesson more important than the need for a civil society driven uh, new architecture for governance and technology that's more social and integrative. Uh, and just like how the GovZero movement integrated social activism, civic media and free software, and built digital public goods for Taiwan civil society to fork and share information, and form and signal consensus. Uh, we aim to build on the example of Taiwan and bring this sort of digital public infrastructure to global civil society. The GCRI uh, can be part of the missing architecture of global governance. It will be a place for anyone looking to reduce global risks and build more sustainable societies. Uh, it's still a work in progress. I'll, I'll share my screen now uh, to quickly show you a few basic screenshots for our website. Uh, so sharing now. And if you can see my screen, uh, we have a landing page up for researchers at the risk.global slash programs, which you can visit now. And it describes a few things that in this case, researchers will be able to do. Uh, and the whole platform will be using in radical exchange spirit uh, mechanisms like Polis, QV, and QF. And we have a tokenized reward system already built in place to facilitate that where necessary. Um, and similar to Patreon or Substack, uh, researchers can accept paid subscriptions and sponsors for their published research. And for that, we're going to be implementing QF, which is exciting. And we plan to extend the same business model to other contexts. Uh, we want a big circular economy and ecosystem. So eventually, you know, we want to be able to fund teachers publishing educational courses, media organizations publishing high quality journalism, developers writing open source and so forth. Uh, the broad theme is to nurture new collective structures of participation, empowerment, solidarity, uh, different kinds of funding institutions, research or organizations, career paths even, and so on. Uh, and in addition to earning an income, uh, researchers and, and other stakeholders can also join teams in what we call a quadruple helix, uh, which is sort of like Taiwan's innovation lab, PDIS. Uh, these are radically horizontal 
and diverse teams cutting across science, industry, policy, and civil society, teams that can find common ground and have the effect of bridging each sector and perspective and thus reinforcing each of their resilience in favor of integrative learning, risk-taking, and co-creation. And all of this with the overarching goal being to better integrate private and public action uh, to build a, a global society that attracts us uh, to, to work together rather than be divided. Uh, so I'll sh stop sharing my screen. Um, and another specific project of ours is developing a new framework for intellectual property rights based on SALSA or cost as an alternative to the dominant patent cooperation treaty. And we're thinking of calling it the Earth Cooperation Treaty. So we're in the process of forming a working group for that. So if you're interested to learn more about that or want to become a member of GCRI, uh, please visit our website, therisk.global and create an account. Uh, you can also email us at contact at therisk.global. We're actively looking for partnerships, especially with policymakers, activists, journalists, also scientists, developers, educators. Uh, so really eager to hear from you. Uh, thank you for listening. Long live Radical Exchange. <laughs> thank you, Jack. Long live Radical Exchange. Wonderful. Um, up next, we have um, Chewy, who will introduce OS City. Over to you, Chewy. Good morning to everyone on this side of the world. I promise that during the next six minutes, uh, you're going to learn about a promising uh, business and impact opportunity that can actually radically change how uh, government works. So because I'm going to be talking about blockchain and governments, I want to take out the hype that it's out there. So our solution that I'm going to be talking in a minute has been already implemented in over 20 public institutions in Latin America, issuing over 10,000 blockchain digital assets and generating over 700,000 US dollars uh, revenue. So the problem that we are tackling, it's uh, the mismatch of today's society of all the expectations on uh, customized services, real-time services, and the way that governments work, that they don't actually meet those expectations. Uh, and the increasing pressure that they are feeling every single week, 3 million people move into cities, and uh, during pandemic, smaller cities started to get more and more populated, putting the government uh, at, a, at a crisis of institutional agility and credibility, having society protesting, and in general, feeling apathy and not wanting to mess with the government or to have anything to do with their public sector. But the reality is that the public sector touches the life of all of us. They are messing with us, they are here with us, uh, and they are aware, at least nine out of 10 public servants, uh, they say that they don't have the tools to meet with today's society's expectations, uh, that they know that they are inefficient, inefficient um, and in McKinsey numbers, this means $5 trillion a year that go missing, or 50% constituent distrust, distrust on average for every country in the world, divided nations. So if there is a lot of inefficiency, if there is a lot of distrust and they are aware of it, we thought, hey, there is a technology for that. Blockchain is this trust machine, is this trust tool. So what, what, why, what if we create blockchain-based governments, meaning to create governments as platforms of citizen-centric digital services? By citizen-centric, what we mean is to create digital identities, blockchain-based digital identities that can be used at wallet where citizens receive their official documents and they stop repeating efforts when doing any government procedure or asking for a government service. And digital services are delivered into those wallets as verifiable blockchain credentials. Just by tapping into government and technology, we are jumping into 400 billion US dollars with 20% component annual growth industry called GovTech. And to give additional numbers on this, government spending on blockchains has increased 11x since 2017, expecting to boom in next year, 2022. And citizen digital identity is the second most important global trend. Um, so what does this look like? Well, we give governments a portal where citizens can log in using their preferred blockchain wallet, declaring their public address to an official login, and then receiving verifiable credentials, digital documents such as this one that anyone scanning a QR can access, click on verify and do a four step open verification. Also, there is a friendly rendering for everyone to understand what is this document about and selective disclosure for protecting people's privacy for citizens to be able to share only what they need to share and not um, uh, everything that they have. 
Around this area, we have become a GovTech first mover. As I said at the beginning, we have issued more than 10,000 official documents on the blockchain from for 29 different flavors, from uh, uh, commercial permits, construction permits, uh, licenses, inspector badges, and even artisan origin products and wine derivatives in Argentina, impacting the lives of almost a million people. Today, we are working with the first national level project with the presidency of Argentina, along with UNICEF Innovation and the Therm Foundation. We have 12 current paying customers, and we're already talking to 30 more potential customers. We have fundraised over half a million dollars since 2017, creating revenue of $700,000, and equipped to revenue in the last 12 months of 200 ETH for creating this a radical change in governments. So don't miss out. This is an opportunity for making big business and big impact. For, uh, so if you know any government representatives willing to implement, please drop me a line. There's my email. Uh, if you want to help us to soft land in Europe, just this year, the European Com Commission has 150 billion euros for blockchain and government modernization projects. That's business. And we are actually uh, in the middle of our funding round. So don't hesitate. Drop me a line. Let's change the world, build the future of government. Thank you, Chiri. Wow, a uh, lot of energy there. Thanks so much for <laughs> uh, bringing us over the hill there. So uh, midway through, um, I just want to point um, people to uh, our Twitter handle where we're um, tweeting many of these conversations and relevant links. And um, so do go to at um, Rad Exchange uh, on Twitter. Uh, and also you can find out um, more about um, each of these projects um, on our website, radicalexchange.org uh, forward slash uh, fellowship. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'm going to hand over to Megan, um, who is going to cover um, the what I thought was very abstract, but turns out to be extraordinarily important, um, issue of epistemic infrastructure. Over to you, Megan. Thank you so much for that kind intro. Thanks, everyone. Um, I, thank you so much for having me and for staring at your screen uh, for another six minutes for this topic. It's such a hard act to follow Chewy and all of these incredible projects. Um, it's been such a privilege to be a part of this community and I'm so grateful. Uh, and I'm also gonna make it a little bit harder for myself as well through opening with something that you might not think is a problem. And that's knowledge flow in a democracy. Uh, now I know particularly in the US, it feels like we're drinking out of the fire hose of information or misinformation all the time. But in a way that's kind of the problem because while individual level access to raw information has heightened our systems for collective civic problem solving in many nations are eroding if they existed at all. And so today I wanna to talk to you about one element in that system that is crumbling beneath us and that's universities. Now, traditionally uh, universities are meant to treat knowledge as a public good and they're really important for democratic deliberation in two ways. One, they do research on long-term civic projects uh, and problems in the community. And two, they circulate knowledge that isn't necessarily accessible. Um, otherwise that also doesn't fold to popular opinion. And so uh, both of these mechanisms work together to inject knowledge that's hard to find and that's necessary that makes our deliberative our deliberations uh, more innovative. Uh, unfortunately, these days that's happening less and less. So while knowledge is meant to be a public good, universities often treat it as a private one uh, because of cuts to public expenditures, patent laws, and um, a series of more recent legislation like privatization of, of publication, universities are pushed to hoard information and to cut off access to the public. And so to give a closer look of how this like happens in our society, let's look at a few examples. So as early as 2012, JSTOR alone turned away 150 million attempts to read publications on their database. Just last year, a few education journals went open access for two months and saw 40% more downloads. And finally, the standard tenure process, which creates a lot of research agendas, which fuels so many publications, has actually no incentive structure to include communities in that research process. This has real consequences on our entire epistemic democracy, on universities and on us right now. The first is justice oriented. So in siloing knowledge generation, it's universities are failing to include community voice, 
which means that it limits the type of research that's developed. This in turn hinders innovation for our entire democracy, limiting the types of ideas that are fathomed and also making our knowledge systems less efficient. And finally, universities are simply failing their duty to the public to work together to create information that responds to real civic problems on the ground. But the thing is, pushing universities towards healthy behavior is really complicated. Not only does privatization compound existing unhealthy behaviors, but universities moved away from public movement, uh, for public contributions before the dawn of the internet. So what does it mean to even participate in this new technological ecosystem? What should it look like? And so the purpose of my project was to try and figure out uh, what it would mean to incentivize universities to contribute to this modern epistemic ecosystem for the first time. So how do we incentivize it healthy, healthy behavior? Um, figuring this out at the local level was a little bit easier. So uh, through this fellowship, I was able to sketch an initial platform that could really strengthen the ties between faculty and their surrounding communities. So on this platform, community advocates advocacy groups can post uh, research needs that they have, for instance, an archivist or an interviewer and researchers can bid to fill those positions. Also, researchers can post their projects and through quadratic funding, community members can effectively endorse what they wanna see in their neighborhoods. Uh, I know this sounds incredibly simplistic, but this would radically change how research agendas are developed and really make massive improvements to how universities both serve their communities and contribute to local civic problem solving. Now, trying to incentivize healthy behavior on a larger scale turned out to be much more complicated for one big reason. We're not really sure what a healthy epistemic ecosystem in the modern day should look like. Research in, on this topic is still incredibly preliminary and young and often experimental, and we're not confident yet what the comprehensive framework for this should be, and therefore unsure how educational institutions should fit into it. So the next step in my work is to figure out a framework for what a healthy epistemic ecosystem is. Now, this is a big concept, right? So I'm going to break it down into three core dimensions that I'm going to pursue in the future. So the first are players. So who are the institutions, organizations, and individuals involved in contributing knowledge to the ecosystem and what should they contribute? The second is process. So what should the exchange of knowledge between parties actually look like with some really exciting work already being done on this in terms of cognitive democracy? And finally, what problems can we expect? So there's a really wonderful framework of the epistemic ecosystem of Athenian democracy. And so we can work from that, what barriers have come up in knowledge generation and exchange since then, and how do we surmount them? Now, there's a ton of work to do, as you can see, but I'm really hoping to tackle this through modeling the behavior that I'm hoping to improve, and that's collective deliberation. And so as a result, I'm opening up a notion platform where folks who are interested in this topic can all come together, crowdsource information and share research findings, their thoughts, and also meet once a quarter to discuss and potentially build the framework for the epistemic ecosystem together. Uh, there's so much to learn and to understand about this, but I am confident that the best way to tackle a community problem is through a community solution. And even marginal improvements to trying to understand how we learn and innovate together can be a catalyst for much deeper social change. But it has to start with this spark, with this question, with this first framing of what our collective imaginations on a system level could be and how we can expand them even further. And so if this sounds like you, I hope that you uh, email to join and I hope to imagine with you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. I hope to imagine with you too. That was uh, wonderful. Um, over to Singapore now, um, channel, uh, channeling um, Veil OS, uh, Raymond. Yeah, one second, share screen. All right, hi everyone, I'm Raymond, happy to be here. Um, today, talking about uh, this platform called Veil OS, um, basically, it's a privacy preserving operating system that's capable of running several operations, right? For the purpose of today's talk, I'm just going to, you know, just section it down to one type of application, which I think all of us use, right? That is voting. The problem that we face right now is that um, there's a big dilemma between the space between authenticating user in an online space and also providing the anonymity. 
What is really hard from uh, in that space is also proving that there is anonymity. So that's also one of the reason right now that there is no solution out there in the market or uh, in the entire world that actually allows a citizen to vote anonymously, right? And even if government claims that um, they do not keep a lot of such uh, votes, right? You still have to have blind faith in the government, right? Or whatever organization that is administering the vote to say that, okay, they didn't keep the vote, right? Because there's a problem first, because I need to first authenticate to in a platform to say that I am even allowed in the set, right? If let's say I'm participating in a US election, I need to be one, I need to be a US citizen, right? So I need to prove who am I to get onto that platform. But then now that I've proved who am I, there's no way that the platform can prove to me that my action on the platform is actually dissociated from my identity, right? And why is this problem important to solve? Um, the, big, the biggest is that, you know, users have their rights to privacy, right? The people, the citizens have the right to their privacy and privacy gives people the space to think, act and gather, right? Um, on, on their own terms, right? And organizations or even states and nations, right? Need to have a higher degree of legitimacy to gain the user's confidence, right? Uh, the last thing you want is that you have an election and everyone is calling it a fraud, right? And on top of it all, right? If you are able to provide privacy as a layer, as a value to your people, you are allowing different organizations to collaborate, to provide value to these people without sharing their private information. So how do you do that, right? Um, emerging right out from the academia world, we are seeing, you know, a huge applications called a uh, huge solution called zero knowledge proof, right? What zero knowledge proof allow you to do is that it allows you to, instead of having a third party uh, where you, you, you ask them to, you know, attest to a certain fact, right? You have technology, this zero knowledge proof circuit that you actually send in your inputs it runs through the it runs through the um, circuits and tell you that you know the circuit passes and that constraints are met, right? So using this technology, right, basically you can assert three constraints. Number one, right, you need a membership proof. That means if let's say I'm a U.S. citizen, right, I need to prove that I am one of the many U.S. citizens. The second constraint is that I need to prove that there is no previous participation. Why this is important is that you can, you need to allow, you need to prove that I have not voted before, so I can't double vote, right? So one thing we know for sure, uh, ring signature is not going to work in this area already. The third is also to protect the identity of the uh, individual uh, citizens or people or users on this platform to help them stay anonymous on this platform. So uh, in that aspect, uh, I have a quick demo to show like how it looks like um, doing a vote on this uh, platform itself. So first up, we are trying to um, look at a US election. So um, uh, identity group is just a group of users. And then uh, the topic is US election. And let's say I'm voting for Donald Trump. So this is the QR code that I'm going to use. So over here, what you'll see is that uh, as a user, I'll be scanning this code uh, and then you can verify the vote. What happens here is that I have generated a zero knowledge proof claim that is being submitted to the government system all without a login system. So the next thing that happens is that uh, you can see that anyone, not just the government, can actually verify that the uh, vote has been correctly generated, right? And then if you notice, this is my identity that I've registered with the register of voters. And yet this identity is nowhere seen within the, um, within the uh, proof that I've submitted to the system. So that means not even the government will have the information to link my vote back to me. So 
What else can this technology do? Uh, because of the anonymity that it provides, you can use it for applications such as whistleblowing, right? Um, suggestion box for an organization. Or if let's say I am rationing some goods uh, in the nation because of let's say a disaster or crisis relief, right? I can actually use this to do a zero knowledge uh, distribution, right? That means I don't need to know your identity, but I know that you have not collected this good once. So what's next from here is that uh, I'm going to implement uh, a voting system using quadratic voting on this platform. Uh, you, and I'm also implementing like uh, smart contract integration so that uh, you can probably hook up to applications such as like Democracy Earth or other kind of DAOs uh, on chain, right? And then uh, basically live demo and identify customer segments on this. Uh, if you wish to help, right, I'd love to, you know, love if you could drop a name of privacy engineer, a uh, policy maker dealing with data privacy, or even a HR leader who might, you know, um, be interested in this kind of technology. Um, also, you know, because this is very new tech, you can try out the demo and give me a feedback. Uh, website is here. Um, you can drop me an email on this link as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raymond. Trust the developer to... Um do a live demo, uh, that was wonderful. Um, so how does any of this get built or funded? Well, hopefully um, Sato uh, in uh, Australia with Unbuilt has some of the answers. Sato, over to you. Okay. Yeah, we are almost catching up the timetable. Um, hi, my name is Sato from <coughs> Unbuilt Ventures. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you all, the mentors, sponsors, and fellows. I would say I have spent the most fertile period in my life as a learner. I also wanted to show my appreciation to uh, co-founders Takumi Endo and Tike Hayashi for massive support. I'm now confident enough to say we can achieve more than before I started the fellowship program. So let me start my presentation. Um, as the project name suggests, we approach social issue as an emerging fund manager of venture capital. Then the issue we picked is the power load of return dominates startup investing. So VC, investments uh, optimized for short-term multiples over long-term prosperities. So we need to find the shape of the future VC supposed to be. And there are so many reasons why this is important to humanity. Um, but if I would select one, it is a question of do we allocate the most valuable resources of the society into the most pressing issue effectively. Our view is the startup ecosystem seduces talented young entrepreneurs into superficial innovation on zero-sum games that doesn't positively impact society or even make it worse. We can find it from the recent trend of career choice of graduate from the colleges in Japan, that top tier student used to choose the public sector over the private. They now pick startup for their first choice. So that, that is great news for venture capitalists, but for society, we should provide enough financial support to the social entrepreneurs. Otherwise, it's the race to the bottom. So um, what is the solution supposed to be? Um, what we can do as a VC is twofold, investing more in social entrepreneurs and distributing more to the society. So our, our approach is bottom up. So please have a look at the graph of the marginal profit curve. It takes um, universality of the issue on the x-axis and difficulty on the y. So the Below the curve is the area of profitable business. Then above the curve on, on the other side is the area of death as a for-profit entity, but essential for humanity. So it, it covered by the government funding or donations, 
So one approach might be more money put on the above the curve, but we choose the other way. So push the curve from the bottom right to the top left. So the bottom, very bottom right is the sweet spot of the VC funding zone. And then revenue-based fi financing, so venture philanthropy is to cover some other areas. And what we do is investing as close as the curve, then encourage the entrepreneurs to find a new way of uh, monetization that push the curve upwards. Um, then we keep trying this. We only invite our investors who understand this concept. So um, that enable us to invest more in civic tech than average VCs. And the radical step should be on our fund too. We will find a way to enable us to distribute upside more to communities that put up the curve toward to the upper left corner more drastically. So, um, on our progress, we have been weaving our investment thesis based on the learning from the fellowship program. We achieved several milestones in the last 10 weeks. And the biggest news is we have got an anchor investor on board during this program. So the next step, we are looking to start funding civic tech projects around the Alexi community especially around DeFi, because we believe it has a huge potential to push the boundary of the notion of profit cap upwards. And uh, at the same time, it gives us many insights to speculate our next step of radical reform or capital raising structure. Having said that, um, we are middle of the capital raise of fund one and larger check size investment will be um, active from Q3. But um, we have got a few dry powder of angel investing. So please feel free to contact me if you are in pre-product stage seeking for funding. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Sato. And, and a VC that aims to give back money to the community. Um, so as Jack said, long live radical exchange, huh? Um, brilliant. So we have um, one final fellow. Um, who is going to introduce um, Sonar. And um, so over to you, Tracy, to take us home. Okay. Hi, I'm Tracy Bowen. I'm a Mercury Music Prize winning artist. And as an artist for over 20 years, I've had firsthand experience of the unfair power balance between streaming companies and users. Tech companies like Spotify are notorious for hoarding profits and music fans don't see any of it. Content creators see very little. Tech companies suck up all the value. The data they cre create from users is often siloed and the people who produce that data have no access to it. Can that be fair? For decades now, tech companies have exploited the data we generate online. It's been difficult for ordinary people to access this market, and they do have a right to access this market to become true participants in the market they help create and sustain. So we want to enable fair access to create value, autonomy, and revenue for ordinary citizens. The solution is Sonar Data Union. Download our app, and with, our, with your permission, we capture the same data that your music streaming platforms already collect. We then aggregate and anonymize it, then we monetize it for you. The results from our focus groups and initial surveys strongly indicate that people are willing to use new products like data unions to earn extra income streams. We are building Sonar as a truly decentralized company with an exit to community strategy so that it will ultimately be owned by its users. The global market for music streaming and podcasts is worth around $30 billion. The advertising revenue for on-demand streaming platforms, including podcasts, are estimated at $2 billion in the US alone. And we want that money to go to music lovers and creators rather than to be hoarded by tech companies. 
We've created a prototype of a functioning data union. We have also prototyped the messaging as this is just as important as the tech. The job ahead of us is to make this a viable product that becomes indispensable to music lovers everywhere. We've already identified diverse groups to test with as accessing wider and more diverse audiences are crucial in the effectiveness of the movement and the product. We're already connected with large companies like Mozilla and making inroads to solidify partnerships with other groups, institutions and businesses. So what's next? To concentrate on building a community and movement around the new data economy to create high quality promotional material that suit the mass market audience and to create effective strategies for adoption of this new tech product. We're going to move on to beta, tech, beta testing next. We definitely want to create as many high value partnerships as possible inside the data rights movement, the data economy and traditional markets. Partnering with existing brands will smooth the road and make data unions part of the everyday lexicon. Monetizing your own data should be a second nature as taken out insurance. Ensuring an ethical future through data unions where everyone can access the data economy will be an exciting cultural and economic change for society. Our multi-purpose token will serve as a governance token and fuel for the burgeoning data union ecosystem. Our long-term view is to create a suite of products that will support a new decentralized financial asset system based on data, all available through the data union network. For now, a standalone data union is a perfect and manageable start to a bright new future. So join the community over at Sonar app and be the first to know when the app is live. We are open to exploring investment from social impact investors, philanthropists and crowd in, crowdfunding platforms. We know working with popular and established brands would give us a boost and normalize data unions. We want to work with brilliant marketeers to make Sonar a household name and to make the internet equitable for us all. We want to work with the bravest of technical thinkers and doers who will help bring complex data collateralized financial products to the masses. So I'd be delighted to hear from any of you who want to join us in our journey to democratizing music streaming. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Wonderful. Um, so that was the last of the fellow presentations. Um, so I hope uh, that the audience there um, saw some of the diversity um, of, of different projects running through um, the cohort. I mean, that, that was what we were aiming for um, as part of the selection process, because we think that real radical change really only comes from a diversity of um, voices. So um, I'd like to thank uh, each uh, fellow for their effort. Um, and their commitment into, into making this a success. And, and it's been an absolute pleasure working with everyone. And so with that, I'd like to hand off to, uh, to Matt, um, who will um, take us away. Thanks. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, I'd like to say first, uh, simply how uh, grateful I am to all of the fellows for the time that we've spent together over the past weeks. Um, I have learned uh, an enormous amount and, um, Although the program is ending now, I think our relationship will uh, will continue, and I'm looking forward to um, you know supporting and and contributing to all of your projects in the coming um, months and indeed years. So uh, the plan now is to have a um, a quick conversation about some sort of um, the the future of radical exchange and some some big ideas and hopefully some inspiring sort of directions for the uh, future of political economy and the the broader project that we're all um, that we're all working on here together. Um, and I think that Vitalik will uh, will join us in a minute for this conversation. Um, but let's. Uh, Let's go ahead and get and get started uh, with uh, with Glenn. So, Glenn, thank you, uh, thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, Matt. Thanks so much. This has been an incredible project. It's really one of the most inspiring things that you guys have all managed to pull off at Radical Exchange, and uh, it was just wonderful hearing all the presentations. So, thanks. 
So Glenn, I'd, I'd like to start with, uh, uh, with a really big question for you, uh, which is that you know, when you think about the, uh, the next 10 years, optimistically, what do you think that uh, the Radical Exchange Movement, Radical Exchange Foundation, and you know, more importantly, all of the, the many people who are uh, connected to this, this big network um, uh, might hope to accomplish? Um, I, I always think about accomplishment and sort of organization relationships in a circular rather than a linear fashion. Um, one simplistic way to think about things is you form communities to accomplish a goal. And that's absolutely correct. Um, but you also try to accomplish a goal to form a community. Um, you know, if you think about World War II or something like that, one of the proudest things in World War II was the defeat of the Nazis um, in imperialist Japan. But actually, in some ways, the greatest accomplishment of World War II was the solidarity it created across a lot of different class groups within Western liberal democracies. And the way Yay, that allowed... James. Oh, hi, Vitalik. Hi, Glenn. Good to see you. Hmm. You too. Uh, and, and the solidarity that that, the, the way that underpinned a new economic and political order within Western countries. And I very much hope something similar with the radical exchange community. I, I hope we'll all struggle to change the laws on data uh, rights. I hope mm -hmm. we'll all struggle to build new um, experiments with voting and uh, and uh, property management and so forth. And at the same time, I hope that that struggle, because it will bring people together across different uh, usual divides, you know, technocratic, populist, activist divides, divides of the standard political spectrum, that, that the very struggle itself will help heal um, and build social capital within our societies to do things that we don't yet know uh, are on the horizon. So I hope that that sort of community building and uh, action taken will each feed off of each other and that we'll come out of it with a healthier social fabric as well as a number of concrete new experiments and institutions that will um, enable us to harness that social fabric uh, for uh, dynamic growth and, and innovation. So in her, um, in her talk with the fellows um, a couple weeks ago, Audrey Tang, uh, the digital minister of Taiwan said that the, the problem many aging democracies are facing is that they need to increase the democratic uh, bit rate. Uh, and what she meant by this is that in, in many other sectors in, in the private sector and in, in all kinds of industries and other ways that we're interacting, uh, the increase, the, the rate of information flow has increased, uh, but democracy has kind of put itself in the back seat by depending on very thin and infrequent um, informational inputs. Uh, this seems like a very different and actually much simpler diagnosis for what is ailing democracy than most commentators would offer. Um, and I'm curious, uh, both Glenn and Vitalik, uh, what you think of that, whether you, uh, whether you agree with it or have anything to, um, uh, um, to add to it. Hmm. Um, I, I definitely think that the, the technologies that we're advocating all have a yeah, much higher bit rate than the kind of one bit or a couple of, a couple of bits every four years that's uh, common in uh, regular democracies. And, and obviously a big part of the reason why we've had uh, kind of such a low bit rates historically is uh, just uh, the fact uh, that, you know, the technology wasn't really there, like, I mean, 100 years ago or 200 years ago to actually make it possible to collect uh, information for people more frequently. Now, again, there is, of course, also a kind of in addition to that, the whole kind of direct democracy versus representative democracy debate, where the representative democracy side like actually says that indirection is a, a, a kind of explicitly good for reasons other than the, yeah, uh, 
like, other than technological limitations. And so I think like, it is also important to kind of go through that conversation and try to understand um, you know, what those reasons are and create democratic systems that are capable of, uh, of incorporating the, um, the positive aspects of that. But I feel like there have been a lot of uh, attempts at doing that already, right? Like, uh, like liquid democracy uh, has uh, kind of a lot of very explicit room for interaction, though in a much more kind of fluid and, uh, and less entrenched form. Um, even you know, quadratic voting and uh, quadratic funding as uh, one example, it's like, there's still room for kind of people to make projects and for that and for those projects to have some kind of internal organization. Uh, so like the design space of both mechanisms and things that we can build around those mechanisms is large. And like I think there's definitely things inside of that design space that work really well, and there's going to be things inside of that design space that work terribly. So I think like directionally, like increasing uh, the bit rate is very important and completely correct, but also you know, we need experimentation, which is what I think uh, is a, a big part of what the movement is about, right? And you know we need to just try a lot of different things and like really understand kind of exactly what versions of the, uh, of the ideas actually do to uh, deliver the best results. And I feel like we're already getting uh, kind of pretty far along to that. I think uh, the thing that I strongly agree with in what Audrey said is that there's a, there's a common framing that like the problem that we're facing is one of control of or um, breaks on technology. And I think an, a better way that I would prefer to frame it is we need to accelerate governance. We need to Im increase the speed of governance improvement rather than decelerate other technologies. Because ultimately, deceleration, uh, like someone is going to innovate, right? If we just slow things down, we'll ultimately just be invaded by whoever doesn't. But if we increase the rate and the quality of governance innovation, then we'll actually accelerate everything. We'll, we'll, we'll go faster than rivals because they aren't because they're reaching a point of diminishing returns and we're on an area that's that's slower. Uh, and at the same time, we'll be able to govern that and move it towards the areas we want to see it move because the area we will have innovated in is one that's about governance and um, uh, social coordination. Yeah, so um, Audrey's remark was a bit of an aha for me because what, what the way I interpreted it is that what what a lot of uh, you know sort of older democracies are, seem to be trying to do is like increasing the fidelity of the of the information that is coming in you know with a, a few bits every two or four years, um, and it, there's a very there's a very limited scope to do that when we have so little information coming in. And if we sort of, if we can kind of increase the, um, you know, by increasing the amount of democratic interaction that is going on between authorities and, and citizens or voters, uh, we have a greater scope to increase the quality of that, of that information. Um, does, that, does that make sense? Does that resonate with either of you? I think so. Cool. So um, here's another question. Um, Vitalik, uh, you've recently talked about an interesting idea, which is uh, the idea of uh, entrepreneurial public goods. And this gets at the possibility that democracy might not provide for all types of public goods very well, since people are not always in a good position to articulate what they want. So for example, some existential risks might not be widely appreciated or some very good things might be hard to imagine. Um, could you say a little bit more about this idea? Um, I'm curious to hear, mm -hmm. uh, hear you flesh it out a little bit in your terms. Mm -hmm. And I'm also curious about um, ways, of, ways of addressing mm -hmm. it, ways of sort of squaring the circle of, mm -hmm. of this issue um, in attractive and democratic ways. Yeah, uh, so I, like, the core idea is I think that in private markets, 
we generally accept this idea that you know there is an important role for people who have um, important and valuable ideas ahead of everyone else and who start executing on those ideas and then basically get proven right by history um, you know a few years in the future and often those people can really benefit as a result like if, if they're founders of startups themselves or if they yeah, invest in those startups and so forth now there isn't really a good public goods analog for this, right? So like, for example, um, you know, the, the, like if, like for, if, for example, uh, you know, you were strongly opposed to slavery in 1840 and you really understood that you know, like ending slavery is a really important humanitarian thing and like we should put a huge amount of focus on it, then it, when, you know, 50 years down the line, when this uh, becomes a yeah, mainstream and a successful position, like, you know, there's no, like, you're not rewarded. And like, it's not even just about so, a, a kind of selfish reward. Like, there isn't even a feedback mechanism that sort of amplifies your signals in the future. Like, there isn't really a yeah, you know, kind of strong selection pressure in, in, that, that tries to kind of identify people that are good at, or, or mechanisms that are good at kind of finding things that are public goods and so that are hard to make a private profit from, but that at the same time uh, kind of have a few people recognize them before uh, they yeah, sort of become second nature for the, uh, for the rest of the world, right? And the challenge, like basically, I feel like a big blind spot of probably all of society is actually finding mechanisms that do a good job of tackling this intersection, right? Like if there is something that's valuable um, and that is a public good. And so it's uh, difficult to um, you know, monetize it as a product. So like examples that I gave um, that I gave that I believe in today, like one was uh, life extension research um, and other was um, research in mitigating existential risks. Um, an example from 50 years ago would be you know, from, uh, Norman Borlaug's uh, work in uh, just ma making it much easier to produce food um, and that really contributed uh, contributed to uh, kind of lessening famines and saving a really huge number of lives. Like what, what can we have mechanisms that just do a good job of identifying those kinds of things? And so I, I think uh, the, uh, the main kind of idea that we've uh, kind of figured out so far is that you can kind of, you know, combine the mechanism tools that we have like Lego bricks, right? Like, you know, you have uh, quadratic funding for public goods. Uh, we have the concept of investment for um, rewarding people who have correct ideas ahead of their time. And so, you know, why not have people invest in projects and then the investors get compensated with uh, quadratic funding, for example. And that's, so interestingly enough, that's something that we, that, that I think, you know, in the Ethereum ecosystem, we might be getting close to, like, uh, um, close to contributing to at some point. Like uh, one of the ideas I heard um, in the context of Gitcoin grants is just doing retroactive Gitcoin grants for people who supported um, and kind of helped implement policy proposals that ended up being really valuable for the Ethereum ecosystem, like uh, EIP-1559, the switch to proof of stake and like, some of the other things that we've done. And like, it would just be interesting to see how that turns out. But you know, like, this is like, kind of one idea and there might be many other ideas as well. I just think it's, uh, like, it's really important to kind of have a conversation and think about this because kind of like by default, I do worry that um, you know, democratic mechanisms implemented naively, like if they just uh, select for things that are already popular. And so they like, there isn't yet this good mechanism for sort of getting over the hump and helping to kind of transition things that aren't popular, uh, that aren't widely considered popular yet, but should be into things that get considered popular. But like, I'm, I'm optimistic that we can figure out more things. Can I add a little wrinkle? Sure. Um, which is that, um, so I think th this is a conversation I had with Alan Defoe, who I think Vitalik knows is a leader on AI governance um, uh, work. So quadratic funding um, is static in a certain way. Um, and I think investment can help with that but it kind of combines a linear capitalist logic 
with a static um, public goods logic. I think even more powerful would be to get a dynamic public goods logic working. So hmm. for example, um, just think about Gitcoin grants, uh, this very, very simplistic example, but what if you had a project that got support from person A today, from person B in the next round, from person C in the following round, and person D in the round after that, versus another project that had three supporters consistent across all rounds. Which project deserves more funding? Arguably the first one, uh, at least under certain conditions. Because you can imagine projects that sort of have generations of people that they benefit um, right. over time. And they actually have a greater sort of diversity of contributors to them. It's just a dynamic rather than a static diversity. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of a public goods version of almost saving. And it gives you a framework potentially for thinking about what's going on with intergenerational altruism or intergenerational coordination. Um, I don't know how to make that all work exactly yet. But I think it's an interesting direction for future research. Hmm. Yeah, so for example, um, Megan's work about epistemic infrastructure strikes me as relevant to this because I think that um, part of the part of the issue being identified here is this idea that sometimes things that um, seem valuable today, you know, turn out to seem less valuable later or vice versa. So that you know our our valuation of, of the quality of an idea <clears throat> or the quality of a service can change over time. I mean and this I think that even sort of non non-democratic or just you know market mechanisms make this mistake all the time, right? That things that you know things that seem like they're providing a lot of value in the short term create a lot of reward for people that provided them. And then looking back 10 years later or something, we think, um, you know, our, our, uh, our opinion about the value that that that, that, that thing provided is, is, is more mixed, like you think of you know, Facebook or something like that. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I mean, do you, do you agree with that, Glenn? Is that, do you think that, you think we can, um, start to try to solve that problem through things like you're, what you're talking about? I mean, potentially, I, you know, there's, the, there's a number of additional complications on QV type, QF type mechanisms that probably would have to all simultaneously make progress for that to really work out. Like, you know, some of these issues about negative contributions that Vitalik and I have gone back and forth on and I don't think have any totally clear perspective on, uh, mm. uh, as well as some of these intertemporal things that I don't think anyone's even tried to deal with. So when you think about, um, so shifting gears just slightly, um, and this is for either or both of you, when you think of uh, artists or communicators um, who have done important work in terms of helping to bring about um, and innovation or better institutions, um, or you know, it's kind of improving the relationship between people and technology in the way that a lot of uh, radical exchange community folks are are working on. Um, who comes to mind? What kinds of um, artists or communicators do you think are are um, are making a difference in this kind of work? I I haven't read it, but Simon de la Riviere didn't he write a novel that like incorporated either blockchains or radical exchange ideas or both? He did, yes. I would call out Ted Chang, uh, who is one of Madden, my favorite science fiction authors. Uh, Gene Roddenberry, you know, who created Star Trek. Um, a lot of the great work going on in the Marvel comic universe. Um, Boots Riley, we obviously had at a radical exchange conference. I think a fabulous thinker. Um, and what is it about those uh, those people's work that you appreciate? 
in the case of Marvel, I think uh, the structure of it has been extremely powerful. The way it offers a variety of perspectives on the same world and speaks to a very wide range of people. I think in the case of Star Trek, it gave one of the most coherent visions of sort of a humanistic and pluralistic future that nonetheless is sort of like really cool like and ambitious. Um, uh, in the case of Boots Riley, I think it was a powerful sort of critique and, you know, light on present society. Um, and in the case of Ted Chang, I think it's, it's a series of really powerful provocations that sort of shift how we conceptualize a lot of issues around technology. Um, in particular, the, 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 there's a movie Arrival, but actually the story is a little bit different. And the story um, is really about sort of, the, in my mind, the problems with the utility function as a way of thinking about things, uh, uh, but done in a very vivid, dramatic way. So I, I, I really appreciate his work. So I'd like to move on to the topic of, um, of identity. So uh, in, in building decentralized governance systems, um, as you know, uh, decision integrity is, is a major issue. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the interesting conversations that came up in, uh, throughout the, the fellowship is, uh, is what constitutes um, good enough in terms of proving unique human identity or disproving collusions? So you know when we're when we're building uh, when we're building system, you know democratic systems or or other kinds of um, you know systems where important uh, collaborative work or decision making is happening, um, uh, proving proving integrity in, in a sort of a rough and ready pragmatic good enough way might be you know might be good enough what is good enough in one context might not be good enough in in another. And it's sometimes hard to foresee, you know, what the um, hard to think about what level of uh, of confidence we need to we need to get to as we're as we're building uh, systems. I'm curious whether either of you have um, have thoughts about this. And this is actually a pretty timely question because uh, if you've been following uh, Gitcoin grants around nine at all. One of the big challenges that they've had is just the large number of attempts of uh, fraud and collusion at, of uh, various kinds happening. Like it went up from a very small percentage of um, all contributions to a fairly large percentage of all contributions. And the um, like, I think the reason why it's happening is because of scale, right? Like, uh, if you have some tiny thing where the, the amount of uh, matching funds at stake is like twenty thousand dollars, then like people will uh, generally uh, participate honestly. But what as the scale goes higher, and like both the scale of the of uh, the money at stake and uh, the scale of the community, the more like you just inevitably get less aligned participants uh, kind of trying to game the mechanism in whatever way they can. And the thing to remember is that like in general for kind of internet social systems in practice, like gaming is the norm and not the exception, right? Like gaming of like say Twitter likes or Reddit upvotes or retweets and all of these uh, mechanisms happens all the time, right? Like fake accounts happen all the time and attempts to kind of just manipulate um, you know what people see by doing these things like they just they're everywhere and so far the only way that we have of uh, solving these problems is that companies like reddit and twitter and like and all the others like they they employ very uh, proprietary and non-transparent methods to try to like, identify um who the malicious participants are and uh, try to remove them and like those methods have to be closed source and proprietary because Otherwise, uh, the attacker would be able to um, just quickly adapt to them. And like, you can make methods that are, that are secure even if the uh, algorithms are fully open source. Like, arguably, the uh, the effort to make mechanisms that are secure even if they're fully open source is like what are the definition of the science of mechanism design. Um, but like, it's a challenge, and there's a combination of uh, kind of various layers of. Uh, of technology that are needed to uh, get closer to that. 
So that's one thing, right? Like it's this sort of ongoing effort. And then the other thing that I think is important to remember is that like attacker versus legitimate participant is not a binary, right? Like there's there's a spectrum, there's a participants that do things that kind of violate the econ the laws of economics that like you're assuming when you're designing the mechanisms like that violate um, you know the assumption of like independent decision making for example but that to the participants and to most human beings still feel like reasonable human behavior like even just things um, like for example you know, you contribute to a project and you get a public thank you for contributing. And like that public thank you is like a bit of a social reward and getting a social reward in exchange for contributing like kind of breaks the rules, but like, you know, really it, it's a thank you. Can you really say that, say there's anything malevolent about that? And, and then there's even things like retroactive um, uh, attempts to reward people who uh, contributed to different projects. There's people contributing to projects because um, you know, those projects are their friends and they care about their friends and there's just all sorts of these complicated motives. And just figuring out how to kind of design the mechanism and draw the line and kind of like design the um, uh, kind of shape the culture around the mechanism like that's just an ongoing challenge that I think can only be solved with experimentation. Matt? Um... I, I think there's a useful concept here that I don't think is wide, widely understood. There, there's kind of two different notions of confidence that I think are often confused. One is what you could call a Bayesian notion of confidence. It's like a probability estimate. But there's another notion of confidence that I think is like more relevant in a lot of these systems, which you might call an adversarial or a bounty notion of confidence. And, um, you know, Bayesian is basically, it's like a static evaluation of what your current probability assessment is, assuming that like the laws of nature are like determining things. The second notion is a sense of at what price is this system breakable? So that notion, they're, they're like really fundamentally totally different notions. Like the first one is built basically on an assumption that regardless of how much I rely on this system, it will have this degree of reliability. Whereas the second notion says, basically the system is more or less fully reliable until I rely on it a certain amount. And then it's fully unreliable beyond that point. Now, neither of these is perfect. Of course, it's probably more like an S curve where like there's a point at which it starts to get much less reliable rather than like it, like a step function. But I think that that's, but in many contexts, I think a step function is like a better approximation than is this like flat line. And so I think we should increasingly use this sort of almost dollar amount quantification of the confidence we have in a system, which says sort of like at what point of like if I give out like $1,000 to everyone, or if I give out $2,000 to everyone who like passes this threshold on the system, is that going to be enough incentive to then break the system? You know what I mean? And I think we should try to more frequently put numbers, not probabilities, but sort of dollar amounts where it breaks on, on the systems that we design. No, it's a... Uh... I've, I've been, in the context of uh, blockchains and cryptocurrency, I've been saying the exact same thing. So definitely agree. So, I mean, you know, practically speaking, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of, you know, our radical change fellows and, and, and others in the community are trying to build systems upon which like important civic functions um, might depend. And in that, in that context, there's this, there's, I think there's this constant trade-off, this sort of uncertainty about, um, you know, between or a, a tension between the desire to to do something and try something uh, that you know where the, it might not be perfect, the, you know, the security of the system might not be perfect to begin with, um, uh, and you know, and and the worry of sort of you know technical lock-in or or the worry that that the system will you know will ultimately go wrong. And so there's, 
I think again here we see, we see this like intertemporal trade-off thing. So you know what's good enough for now might not be might not be good enough down the road. Might need to be improved down the road. So I'm curious, you know, just from like a very practical, pragmatic perspective, if you have advice for um, for systems builders about how to think about that. Hmm. Trying to think about like what I can say. Other like I feel like any way you can rephrase the question a bit more. Uh, well, yeah, I guess. I mean, I'm just. I think that you know, in a lot of our conversations, a sort of a tension came up between uh, between like. Um, uh, being too much of a perfectionist and being right. irresponsible in the systems building. Mm. And, um, uh -huh. and it just, it's just a, I don't think there's an answer, but it's a difficult, right. uh, it's a difficult balance that a lot of people are trying to strike. Yeah. I think like my answer would be to focus on kind of experimentation and iteration, like, uh, I'm going to start something at a yeah, small scale and then you start to see what the problems are. And, um, you know, if you've missed the problems, then, uh, at some dollar amounts, the real world will definitely tell you what the problems are. And um, you just like start moving toward fixing it and uh, keep improving and going from there. And, like I think uh, just given uh, like the difference between building fully technical systems and kind of hybrid technical social systems is that the, like there is this social component and the social component is a uh, very hard to model. And so like, I don't really, there isn't really a way to kind of perfect the th something in theory land and push it out there. Like I think you pretty much just have to go back and forth. And like you, you do need uh, a yeah, uh, like this sort of two way communication between the yeah, kind of technical and, and the, the social side, right? Like sometimes, you know, there are kind of social glitches that have to, that, um, that have technical fixes. And then sometimes there's technical glitches that have social fixes. Mm, just like, make sure to not have a firewall and to make sure that, you know, you, you are engaging both sides. And, and I'd also say like, just, just to maybe put a little bit more detail on that, like I often think that um, you can rely on social fabric like early on uh, before you scale and you could, that can buy you some space to build solutions that are more scalable beyond that narrow social fabric. But by the way, it's incredibly important that you use that space that you get bought to actually solve the other problems rather than just being naive. Uh, I think that's basically what happened with the internet. I think basically what happened with the internet was like, there was a really good social fabric and like those defense communities and uh, academic things. People were just like, ah, it'll work itself out at scale. And when it got to scale, it just sort of got colonized by people who had other solutions to those problems that were more closed source and proprietary because people sort of thought it's all fine, not they were looking for those emerging problems and trying to address them, you know. Where do you think uh, proof of personhood or proof of human networks will be uh, in five years? Um, I expect them to be much further along and I expect a kind of a lot of people to just have accounts on them and be and to use them. Um, my experience with uh, these kinds of things is that like if it's just in a kind of idealistic or enthusiast thing, then the amount of participation that you get is uh, fairly small, and the amount of, and the kinds of participants that you get are fairly kind of selective and unrepresentative. But like one of the nice things about how proof of personhood is uh, kind of making its way forward in the crypto space, right, is that. You know, the crypto space does have incentives, it does have a kind of money sloshing around, and it does have like the ability, uh, like there's just incentives on all, uh, on the kind of all sides for people to make the mechanisms more secure, for people to try to be the red team and try to break the mechanisms, for people to actually I lost Vitalik too, Matt. I lost him too. Okay. Um, um, did, I, did I cut out somewhere? Yeah, yeah you just cut out for a moment. <laughs> yeah, just saying that like it's uh, 
there's with these uh, proof of there's like a, a lot of incentives to participate like you know you get your proof of humanity id so you can collect the crypto ubi or so that you can um participate in gitcoin grants or so that you can um you know get a spot in some airdrop that tries to be egalitarian and so on and so forth and so like the the fact that it's connected to at least one uh, or at least like a few um initial use cases i think is definitely like positive for the development of that and then you know we'll see how it goes in a few years um i i i would i say i i agree and i'd put in the caution that it's very important that everyone within radical exchange realize that like um even the best coolest most awesome technologies can very easily or naturally like be turned in directions that are really problematic and so you just always have to be looking like there is no technical solution to the socio-technical problem of like keeping innovation on a like positive trajectory uh like i am i actually haven't seen i'm actually amazed i haven't seen like for particularly quadratic voting salsa and qf like really like awful applications yet i, I don't know if you have vitalik mm -hmm. But no, we have not getting any traction, but I actually think that's like a surprise, you know, like, mm -hmm. I think proof of personhood, like there's some really, really bad stuff that I'm already starting to see. I won't call out specific examples right now, but like, um, no matter how much you like a technology, always be looking out for the, mm -hmm. for the bad, bad use cases. So, yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, Glenn and Vitalik. In some ways, I'm actually. I was just gonna say, in some ways, I'm happy that the proof of that the these proof of personhood technologies are fairly imperfect, and if you have enough resources, you can get around them. Like, if you're scared about the consequences that something might have, like a a, a finitely strong system is vastly less scary than an infinitely strong system. Mm. Thank. Uh... So to both of you, thank you so much for uh, your time today. And even more than that, thank you for everything you've done to help build the uh, Radical Exchange community and movement. Um, it's, uh, I think we're all really grateful to you. And um, yeah, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll deliver a, um, I, I'll humbly offer just a couple quick thoughts and then turn it over to, uh, to Jen to close the, uh, close the event. So um, I think that, more than ever, uh, the future of democracy really depends upon building the, the right kind of tools. Uh, but the thing is, tools are really are never silver bullets. Um, so we basically want them to be humble sort of steps in the right direction. And in addition not to being silver bullets, tools are not neutral. Um, they're, they're always, and they always turn out to be sort of containers for our actions. And our actions often take the shape of their containers. So tools, you know, in this sense, they can be legitimate in just the same sort of way that governments can be, you know, legitimate or not. Um, another way of putting that is that, you know, tools can be things that people would sort of reasonably endorse or not. And the kind of tools that I would want to endorse uh, are ones that tend to strengthen community, uh, that help us form better intentions, and that help us understand one another more deeply. Um, I think that's the kind of thing that, um, Radical Exchange Fellows uh, are trying to build. Uh, that's what we're all working on here. And I'm really, really proud to, uh, to have gotten to know all of you and to be, to be working with you now and in the future. So uh, thank you. And with that, I will turn it to Jen. Thank you. I'm just waiting for my video to be able to start. Okay, well, I'll just... Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. This has been really, really impressive. And I feel very good to know that you're all working on these things and they're starting to go out into the world. Thank you, Glenn and Vitalik and Matt for a wonderful conversation, enlightening. Um, thank you to everybody for tuning in and to all the mentors. If you liked what you heard here, and you'd like to get involved, there are a number of ways to do that. A bit specifically, we're in the midst of preparing for our 2021 annual conference, which we plan to take place in two locations, Taiwan and the US, 
and is being set up as a conversation between the two with an emphasis on learning from Taiwan. If you want to support that or get involved, write to support at radicalexchange.org. Our next monthly call is next week on Wednesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and that's like 6 p.m. Central Time. I'm not sure where everybody is in their time changes right now, but that's the best I can give. Um, be free to join in on that call. Just sign up on the website, subscribe, and you'll be sent um, information about that. And then if you want to find out more about possibly starting a chapter or getting involved with the one that is local to where you are, you can write Angela at chapters with an S at radicalexchange.org. And we also are going to be launching Radical Exchange Voice soon, a beta launch. Um, it's a new tool that we've built to make Radical Exchange Foundation more democratic. So please write to voice at radicalexchange.com, V-O-I-C-E at radicalexchange.org, sorry, uh, to get involved in that as well. And thank you everyone again. Thank you, Lawrence, for leading this wonderful program. And we look forward to doing it again. <laughs>